When I was a fighting man, the kettle drums they beat. The people scattered gold dust before my horse's feet. But now I am a great king, the people hound my track. With poison in my wine cup, and daggers at my back. The Road of Kings Chapter 2 The room was large and ornate, with rich tapestries on the polished paneled walls, deep rugs on the ivory floor, and with the lofty ceiling adorned with intricate carvings and silver scrollwork. Behind an ivory, golden-laid writing table sat a man whose broad shoulders and sun-browned skin seemed out of place among those luxuriant surroundings. He seemed more a part of the sun and winds and high places of the outlands. The slightest movement spoke of steel spring muscles knit to a keen brain with the coordination of a born fighting man. There was nothing deliberate or measured about his actions. Either he was perfectly at rest, still as a bronze statue, or else he was in motion, not with the jerky quickness of over-tense nerves. But with a cat-like speed that blurred the sight which tried to follow him. His garments were of rich fabric, but simply made. He wore no ring or ornaments, and his square-cut black mane was confined merely by a cloth of silver band about his head. Now he laid down the golden stylus with which he had been laboriously scrawling on waxed papyrus, rested his chin on his fist, and fixed his smoldering blue eyes enviously on the man who stood before him. This person was occupied in his own affairs at the moment, for he was taking up the laces of his gold-chased armor, and abstractedly whistling, a rather unconventional performance. Considering that he was in the presence of a king. Prospero, said the man at the table, these matters of statecraft weary me as all the fighting I have done never did. All part of the game, Conan, answered the dark-eyed Poitanian. You are king, you must play the part. I wish I might ride with you to Nemedia, said Conan enviously. It seems ages since I had a horse between my knees. But Publius says that affairs in the city require my presence. Curse him. When I overthrew the old dynasty, he continued, speaking with the easy familiarity which existed only between the Poitanian and himself. It was easy enough, though it seemed bitter hard at the time. Looking back now over the wild path I followed, all those days of toil, intrigue, slaughter and tribulation seem like a dream. I did not dream far enough, Prospero. And King, Numidides, lay dead at my feet and I tore the crown from his gory head and set it on my own. I had reached the ultimate border of my dreams. I had prepared myself to take the crown, not to hold it. In the old free days all I wanted was a sharp sword and a straight path to my enemies. Now no paths are straight and my sword is useless. When I overthrew Numidides, then I was the liberator. Now they spit at my shadow. Have put a statue of that swine in the temple of Mitra, and people go and wail before it, hailing it as the holy effigy of a saintly monarch who was done to death by a red-handed barbarian. When I led her armies to victory as a mercenary, Aquilonia overlooked the fact that I was a foreigner, but now she cannot forgive me. Now in Mitra's temple there come to burn incense to Numidide's memory, men whom his hangman maimed and blinded, men whose sons died in his dungeons wives and daughters were dragged into his seraglio. The fickle fools. Rinaldo is largely responsible, answered Prospero, drawing up his sword belt another notch. He sings songs that make men mad. Hang him in his jester's garb to the highest tower in the city. Let him make rhymes for the vultures. Conan shook his lion head. No, Prospero. He's beyond my reach. A great poet is greater than any king. His songs are mightier than my scepter. For he has near ripped the heart from my breast when he chose to sing for me. I shall die and be forgotten. But Rinaldo's songs will live forever. No, Prospero. The king continued, a somber look of doubt shadowing his eyes. There is something hidden. Some undercurrent of which we are not aware. I sense it as in my youth I sense the tiger hidden in the tall grass. 
There is a nameless unrest throughout the kingdom. I am like a hunter who crouches by his small fire amid the forest. Hears stealthy feet padding in the darkness. And almost sees the glimmer of burning eyes. If I could but come to grips with something tangible, I could cleave with my sword. I tell you. It's not by chance that the Picts have of late so fiercely assailed the frontiers. So that the Bessonians have called for aid to beat them back. I should have ridden with the troops. Publius feared a plot to trap and slay you beyond the frontier, replied Prospero, smoothing his silken surcoat over his shining mail, and admiring his tall lithe figure in a silver mirror. That's why he urged you to remain in the city. These doubts are born of your barbarian instincts. Let the people snarl. The mercenaries are ours, and the black dragons, and every rogue in Poiton swears by you. Your only danger is assassination, and that's impossible, with men of the Imperial troops guarding you day and night. What are you working at there? A map. Conan answered with pride. The maps of the court show well the countries of south, east and west. But in the north they are vague and faulty. I am adding the northern lands myself. Here is Samaria, where I was born. And... Asgard and Vanaheim, Prospero scanned the map. By Mitra. I had almost believed those countries to have been fabulous. Conan grinned savagely, involuntarily touching the scars on his dark face. You had known otherwise, had you spent your youth on the northern frontiers of Samaria. Asgard lies to the north, and Vanaheim to the northwest of Samaria. And there is continual war along the borders. What manner of men are these northern folk, asked Prospero. Tall and fair and blue-eyed. Their god is Ymir, the frost giant. Each tribe has its own king. They are wayward and fierce. They fight all day and drink ale and roar their wild songs all night. Then I think you are like them, laughed Prospero. You laugh greatly, drink deep and bellow good songs, though I never saw another Sumerian who drank aught but water, or who ever laughed, or ever sang save to chant dismal dirges. Perhaps it's the land they live in answered the king. A gloomier land never was. All of hills, darkly wooded, under skies nearly always gray, with winds moaning drearily down the valleys. Little wonder men grow moody there, quoth Prospero with a shrug of his shoulders, thinking of the smiling sun-washed plains and blue lazy rivers of Poitin, Aquilonia's southernmost province. They have no hope here or hereafter, answered Conan. Their gods are Krom and his dark race, who rule over a sunless place of everlasting mist, which is the world of the dead. Mitra. The ways of the Asir were more to my liking. Well, grinned Prospero, the dark hills of Samaria are far behind you. Now I go. I'll quaff a goblet of white Nemedian wine for you at Numa's court. Good. Grunted the king. But kiss Numa's dancing girls for yourself only lest you involve the states." His gusty laughter followed Prospero out of the chamber. 